Hello and welcome to the next talk that we have from Chris Maney. He is a senior, get this right, a senior data scientist for the healthcare evaluation team, a data team, also known as HEAD, at the University Hospitals Birmingham NHS Foundation Trust. He leads on the development of data science techniques in informatics at the Trust, but he's also an active member of NHS community. He's contributed and I think basically run some of it, the NHSR data sets package that we have. And his talk today is going to be about building predictive models using HES, which is the healthcare evaluation. Uh, you're going to have to fill that in, sorry. Will do. Episode. So you'll have to mention <laughs> that in your talk. Statistics. Yeah, be yeah, using R. Take the one. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, Zoe. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, morning. It's uh, really good to hear what Sarah had to say. Um, I think there's plenty of us in um, trusts who are pushing to move into say the likes of open source software, but um, we're fighting a very familiar battle around the country. Uh, so it's really good to see uh, NHSX are behind that. Um, and I'm quite excited about where we're going with that. So today I'm gonna to talk to you about building predictive models with HES data, um, which is something we do in HED quite a lot, uh, but it's a talk in a few different parts. So I'm gonna to talk to you about uh, case mix adjustment, first of all, and what the heck it is and why would you do it? talk to you a little bit about a specific example of how we do it for readmissions uh, and the problems we have and some of the solutions to those problems. And then I'm also gonna talk a little bit at the end about, um, so how do we make it actually work on desktop machines for the most part? Um, uh, and then maybe to give you a little bit of background um, to understand that we haven't just arrived at this position overnight. Um, we didn't simply start by writing production grade R code. Uh, there was a journey to get there. So I'll share some of that with you. So uh, just to explain um, who HED are. So I work for Healthcare Evaluation Data. We're uh, a business unit of informatics at University Hospitals Birmingham. Uh, and we provide an online benchmarking solution that's used by around 50 or so acute hospitals uh, and another of uh, a number of other NHS organizations and a couple of other partners. Um, we focus on using the HES data or nationally available data sets, um, particularly for doing things that uh, maybe aren't common or you don't have data sharing agreements or um, maybe the capacity to work with things like HES data at your own trust. Uh, we also specialize in some of the more complex, I guess, statistical methods around some of the predictive models, particularly around mortality. Um, so a lot of that is, is kind of my sort of work within HEDs, building mortality, readmission models, et cetera. So first of all, in order to give you a bit of context, I want to talk a little bit about case mix adjustment uh, and, and what it is. So when I say case mix adjustment, it'll become a bit clearer when we talk about it, but you could understand this as um, the things that predict something as well. So the basis for predictive models in machine learning, for example, in, in um, supervised learning is really not very far from this, but it's a, it's a sort of a particular philosophical point and we tend to refer to case mix in medical settings but I'm going to ask you the question first so how could we compare indicators uh, across a number of different units so let's say we have a number of different hospitals we have a number of different uh, GP practices etc uh, or regions or things like that if we had uh, a generic indicator you might consider maybe we'd average across regions um, maybe we'd have to try and do something specific to um, understand the setup of the region but I think it probably all quickly get to the point of it's, it's not really fair if we compare say London with um, Lancashire because the, the urban mix is different and also you know, you know things like that so there are a number of different things that when we try and do comparisons across different units make this difficult so to explain this I thought I'd look for a good picture um, and I didn't find a good picture so I ended up with barrels um, this is something that I have uh, gratefully borrowed from Wikipedia. And let's imagine our question here is, what's the average alcohol consumption? But the thing that you've got to count is barrels. So maybe we could count up the uh, average number of barrels across our regions, and that would give us some sort of idea. But there's a few issues with this. So first of all, you'll notice the different sizes of barrels. So if you've got a different size barrel, it stands to reason that there's different uh, amounts of alcohol in this. 
but also because you fall down rabbit holes with internet stuff, right? So I started reading the page on Wikipedia about barrels. Yes, I'm that interesting. Um, and I found out that this one, particularly the barrel, right, has different sizes, slightly different sizes, depending on whether or not it's got ale in it, whether or not it's got um, uh, beer, because beer and ale definitions for the, the ale fans amongst you, I'm sure we can find out more there. Um, but also for wine, if you had a wine barrel, that's a different size again. So you might also think the content is different. So if I put wine in a barrel versus beer, the alcohol level's higher. So even though they're the same size, actually the, the components inside it are different. And that would affect our question as well. So broadly, if we translate this across to something to do with health, uh, sorry, my point if my points disappear underneath the head in the uh, bottom left here, but let's say this is hospitals instead, right? If we have a different size hospital, it stands to reason that whatever we're counting up at that hospital will be different to a small hospital. So in my region, uh, I work for University Hospital Birmingham. We've got four uh, hospitals in our trust. It's quite large. So it's not a fair comparison with one small hospital like George Elliot, which is down the road. It, it just isn't a reasonable comparison to average at, uh, our trust and average at theirs. Um, but also the contents. So let's say each patient is different. So every single patient that comes into a hospital has their own mix of case mix factors. So this might be uh, their age. It might be whether or not they're elective or emergency. It might be what primary diagnosis they have. So if we're looking to count things up in units, but the, the size and the components within that unit are different, then we need to try and take some sort of account of this. Otherwise, we're going to make very strange uh, and very unreliable and potentially quite biased comparisons. So I'm going to talk to you particularly about one approach, which is a so-called indirectly standardized ratio. And the, the public health inclined people amongst you will know this inside out, I'm sure. Um, but the idea of an indirectly standardized ratio is that we try and adjust all of our smallest units, essentially, to what we would expect as the, the average across the group. So that might seem like a strange concept, but I'll explain it in context of a regression model now. So if we use a regression to estimate the effects of a different predictor, so let's say the age, um, the, whether or not uh, a patient is elective or emergency, we can use that model to work out the risk associated with each of those characteristics. And then once we work that out, that's what a regression model does. We can then use that model to predict back onto the patient data set. And the patient data set, each patient will then receive a risk score. So let's say it's a mortality measure or a readmission measure or something, they'll have a, a risk of that event, a risk of death associated with them. And we can then sum that up then, let's say per hospital. So if we summed up the number of events, so we could get a relative risk ratio, let's say for readmission of the total number of readmissions over the sum of the probability of readmission over our patients. So we end up with a, a, an observed over expected essentially. Uh, and expected isn't, a, it's not a clinical thing here. It's a, it's a how often did this happen in our data set? And this is true whether you use a regression model, a random forest, a neural net, whatever you use, uh, if you're predicting uh, a set of events and getting a, a set of probabilities out, you could do this sort of thing. So by way of a case study then, in HED, we have a measure that looks for readmission to any acute providers within 30 days of discharge from another. So the idea is that for hospital A, if you discharge a patient and they are readmitted to any other hospital, including your own, within 30 days, uh, we chalk up a readmission event to hospital A. So not to the receiving hospital, hospital B, uh, to hospital A. But given that we have the HES data, which is across the whole country, uh, we can look at this across different providers. So when we're building our case mix model, we use a bunch of different variables here. Uh, so those primarily relate to things like uh, the patient demographics, uh, particularly whether or not they're emergency or elective, because that's quite a strong predictor. What it is they're coming to hospital for. So are they, are they coming in because they have a fractured hip or because they've had a stroke? Or, you know, so, so that is quite important to understand what they're coming into the hospital for. And some sort of measure of their overall health status. So we might use a comorbidity score or we might use some sort of frailty index or something or other that gives us a measure of how well a patient is. But how we parameterize these is actually really important. So and I'll go on to explain that in a second. So um, if we just put age as a continuous variable, that's per perfectly reasonable. It's one way of doing it. But 
it's going to assume then that the effective age is constant across the whole range, which it might not be. It might be that age, for example, for a given condition, it's really not very predictive until you hit uh, later in life. And then from a certain age, the risk might increase quite dramatically. So things you can do here are binning or you can do transformation. So you can you could log transform a predictor or square root it or whatever. Uh, or you could chunk it into categories. You could say age in five year, 10 year categories or things like that. They're, they're common options. But the main point here is that if you're building a regression model, what it's essentially assuming um, is that all of your points are independent as well. So all patients um, with a given set of characteristics have exactly the same risk as all other patients with that characteristic. But it's not really quite that simple because case mix adjustment, as uh, in fact, Professor Mohammed and his colleagues have said before, there is a fallacy around it, which means that because we have made a case mix adjustment, there's no longer any effects of case mix. That's not quite true. What we've done is we've adjusted for the average effects of case mix. So we have things like clustering, where a particular patient being treated in one health economy will always be a little bit more like patients in that health economy than they will the national average. So uh, for those of you familiar with uh, clinical trials, we often have clusters in clinical trials because of recruitment centers. And it's just the same with statistics at hospitals. So a great many statistics don't make an adjustment for the fact that we have clusters because of the way local services are set up and the differences between local organizations. So one of the first two things that I want to draw your attention to. So those of you who are in my regression workshop the other day will uh, have heard me labor on about using regression models and understanding um, the coefficients, using them to predict, et cetera. But what if it's not as simple as um, our x variable, just straight up predicting y across the whole range. So to explain what I mean, let's imagine we've got this data set here. So y is the thing we're going to predict, and x is the thing that we're using to predict it. So you might say that uh, I want to know for a patient of, or for, for a variable x of 100, what, what y do we get? And it's about 50. But you'll see it's a sort of sigmoidal pattern here, where it doesn't really go up very much from about 50. Uh, 0 to 50 and doesn't really go that up that much from 150 to 200 but it does go up quite a lot between 50 and 150 so it's not equal across the whole range so if we fitted a normal traditional regression model across this this is what it does it throws a line straight across it and you'll notice here we're kind of rather overscoring this section here and you could say that we're kind of underscoring there as well so it's not really the best fit across the range of the data, but it is a good average fit across the total. So it doesn't fit particularly well locally uh, across the range, but it does fit globally across the range. So if we were to break them into categories, then let's say we did um, 0 to 50, 50 to 150, and 150 or more. What you're effectively fitting then is um, any value under here gives an x of, I don't know what, 10? Gives a y of 10, sorry. Uh, any value with an x of 50 to 100 gives a y value of 50, uh, sorry, to 150, and any uh, x value over 150 gives you 100. So, yeah, sure, it works, but it's crude, isn't it? We're losing information here. But how about we do something a bit more like this? So this is a polynomial fit, which uh, don't let the mathsy word scare you, uh, but broadly it's a, it's a function. So we, we add a bit of maths around it to better describe the dynamics of the data and using that function we then get a much better fit so this leads us into a really nice extension of a regression model called a generalized additive model or a gam um, again slightly mathy description here but what we have is a smooth piecewise polynomial so we have a series of different polynomials that are fitted together in a smooth fashion from one polynomial to the next and they're joined at things called knot points so you'll see where the inflections in this are, is where there are not points. And each one of these is a sort of uh, a polynomial of degree three. So it's a kind of S-shaped polynomial. And then it's joined at these not points in a continuous fashion. So you can get really quite a flexible fit that depends um, really nicely on your data. Now, the reason we use it in a generalized additive model framework, rather than just doing a really tight fit to the data, is because it's really, really easy to overfit at this point. Uh, we can be fitting noise in our data set. So the mechanisms around a generalized additive model fit these functions, 
but they fit them in such a way that there is a tension between um, how well it fits uh, and how, how biased it is. So essentially, we end up with a, a kind of almost a simplified regression model in a way where we're predicting our y based on an intercept, but then we're estimating a function of x, and that function is this spline. And then we've got an error term as well. So actually, GAMs are a really nice extension to a regression if your data has got a nonlinear uh, relationship. So in terms of doing that in R, uh, I'm going to recommend to you Professor Simon Wood's package. Um, it's kind of become the de facto in R. Uh, there are a number of different implementations of GAMs. Don't get me wrong. They were originally proposed by um, Hasti, I think it was Hasti Tipsharani. Um, and there are a number of different ways of doing them. But this is a nice way that, um, as I say, minimizes the tension of the overfitting. So they're just like a regression model, but we use the MGCB package, which is Professor Wood's package, um, where we use a GAM rather than a GLM. We're predicting Y with X. But in order to tell it to draw that spline around it, we've got an S, which is a smooth function. And we've got a couple of other things we can supply. So BS here, obvious joke there, um, is the so it's the basis for the function. So there's a number of different types of function you can use for this, uh, and the basis here is a regression spline. And you can tweak the number of knots as well by supplying more or, or fewer. And this would then give you a very similar output to those you'd expect in a regression model, but we've got approximate significance of smooth terms. So you can have parametric terms; they don't all need to be smooth. So you can see the inter the intercept here isn't smooth, but the uh, X term we put in is smoothed. So it gives you a much more flexible fit. So the other thing I said was clustering. So because our data is collected at centers, so hospitals, it's uh, not random across the population. So let's just uh, take another plot here. Let's imagine that we're looking for the average fit across this plot. This is totally reasonable if all of our points are independent and not clustered in any way. But what if they are? What if they're actually more like this? And actually, one organization is quite a bit higher than this other one. And shout out to John McDonald here for his rock themes package. That's where I got the colors from. Good one, John. He's speaking this afternoon. Sorry, did I say his name right? John, John McIntosh, what am I talking about? McIntosh. Yeah. Forgive me, John. Um, anyway, get flustered when I uh, try and go off piste. But let's say we could use a model that we keep that global intercept, the red one across the center, but we allow an intercept for each one of our clusters. So can you see here, I've got a different colored intercept additional to the other one. So this is where we can go with a so-called random effects model. Now, random effects as a concept are fairly tricky and you need to have a good basis in um, regression models to do that. But what we're actually doing here, and you can see from the previous slide, is we're saying that although we have a global intercept, we can allow each cluster to have its own intercept that is slightly off from the main original intercept. And we can estimate how far away that cluster is. And we can try and pull those effects out from the global intercept. So this is commonly done in R using LME4. And there's a number of other packages, depending on whether you're doing Bayesian or Frequentist or all sorts of different things, because they, they work under both frameworks. But the key thing here, if you're using LME4, is we're using the ELMA function or GLM, uh, and to code this random intercept for, so uh, one is intercept term here, one intercept per cluster uh, is entered like that. And you'll find that we have an estimate of the random effects, an estimate of the fixed effects. So this is the effects of X and the intercept taking out the effects of the clustering. So it allows you to get a much better global average and a much better estimate of the uh, parameters, but they are a little bit trickier to fit and understand. So how do we then use them in HED? So having built these models on our different HRG groups, um, each of them has a slightly different fit depending on the components of the group. Uh, we then predict them back onto the patient data set and we then present it back within an interactive module like this. So this isn't using R or Shiny for those of you who like R and Shiny. Um, we weren't at that point when we originally built HED, um, but this is a, a tool called Spotfire, which if you're familiar with Tableau, it's, a, it's a, the same sort of type of tool as that. Um, so we give customers um, a huge array of different filtering options uh, and ways to then chop and change them and present them. And we present them in things like funnel plots, which I won't go into, because that's a talk for another day. Um, 
but we give um, our customers the opportunity to cut their own data, but with these risk scores associated, so we can get risk ratios out. So if we have a readmission, uh, a relative risk ratio here, where we have more events than were predicted, we would have our point above 100, and if it was significant, it would go outside of the funnel limits. So just a couple of quick things about how we build them. So like, yeah, HES, it's pretty tricky, right? There's loads of data in HES. Um, yes, it's really tricky to do on your desktop machine. Um, and because we didn't have money for an R server at the time, because all the money was in the SQL servers, um, we had to try and be a bit efficient. So the way we learned to do that really was by trying to put as little stuff in memory as possible. Um, and also to use the data table package. So if you've not used data table, again, John's talked about that later, I think. Um, but data table is fantastic. It is very, very, very fast. Um, it is a keyed optimized take on the data frame uh, with an index. So it does work very, very quickly. Uh, and it works by um, replacing values in situ rather than by co copying and bloating your memory. So it's very, very useful. Um, we also took a principle of don't load anything you don't need. So if you're building a particular model on a particular HRG subchapter, don't load the others. Only go and pull the, the chapter that you need for a particular model at a particular time. And when you build these models, you're building a, a model matrix. So this is generally a huge, relatively sparse matrix if you've got lots of factors in it. And uh, if you use R's version of a sparse matrix rather than a regular model matrix, it saves loads of memory. We also tried doing things in parallelization, which didn't work very well on desktops because the poor desktop crumpled under the weight of it. Um, but it does work a lot better on Linux. So speaking of which, uh, after much um, uh, fear and seeing how well other people do it, I'm looking at Chris Beely and other people, um, we sort of finally took the plunge on trying to set up a Linux VM for an R Studio server. And it has revolutionized the speed of how we can do these things. Um, we've still got a long way to go on how much further we could take it. But um, I think um, it's a really good option. So um, it, it involves a degree of Linux skill, but it, it's really helped us. So do consider this if you're trying to build models at scale. There's also a bunch of optimized functions. If you dig around in the R package functions, you'll find things like BAM, which is a big additive model which from GAM, um, or you'll see things like big GLM, which again are optimized functions. And just my sort of final thing on our, our journey of how we got here. So we used SAS for ages before we got anywhere near R, um, and barely anyone touched it because it was complicated and we didn't want to break it. So I was fortunate enough to have some PhD work funded by UHB, which allowed me a bit of space to continually bang my head against the um, R until it finally worked for me. Um, so I think having that space to get stuff wrong that wasn't important to the core development of HED was really helpful. So as I say, I was quite useless for a long time. Um, but then that allowed me to fix the, the broken SAS models by proposing new R ones. So they then sort of started working their way into our production because we were using them to um, to replace some of the models that we, we weren't keen on fixing. But initially that was just my really poor, kludgy annotated scripts. That doesn't really work though for passing it on to other people and it doesn't work to uh, catch errors and things like that. So if I ran a model and it failed in the last 10 minutes after four hours of running, what do you do? That's a, a bad situation. So we, we took this on and I'll just name check my colleague Matthew Bass there. Um, because he's done a lot of the work building this into um, an R package where we have a lot of functions that send metadata back and forth and log it in the database. And we can much easily, uh, it's much much easier to track what things where the, uh, the model fails. Uh, and it also, because we're working on a package, it encourages us to adopt source control and start using Git as well, because we're all working on different bits and pieces and it helps us to integrate that. And I'd really recommend that if you're working collaboratively. Um, and this now means we've got a model management database, which is powered by the functions in R, but it's sat on the SQL server. It's not doing um, stuff in R that it doesn't need to do. So by way of summary, R is awesome for building stuff like case mix adjustment models. Uh, it really, really is good. It's got both data handling capacity and all the modeling stuff. Um, but in this particular case, I was laboring on random effects and GAM models, but that's because you need to understand your data, understand the relationships between the predictors, or you, you can make some very daft assumptions. So I used a regression here, and we apply that to an indirect standardization. 
well, actually it's a, it's a GAN model that's an extension of a regression but this is true for any type of um, method that will give you a probability outcome so you can use you can even use classifiers or things like that but it's the threshold is different um, when you're looking at hospital readmissions for HED the things that were key were this non-linear relationship so there were a number of the predictors that were non-linear and the GAM really really helped that it, also understanding that we have these clusters so using a random intercept was really really helpful again in increasing the fit and helping us not make daft assumptions um, but if I can leave you with one thought, which is use R in its right place. R is brilliant, but it doesn't need to replace your SQL servers, which is exactly why I enjoyed Zoe's talk the other day. Um, we do loads of the processing in the SQL server and we pull stuff out to R to do the modeling and then we shuttle it back. Okay, thank you so very much. We've got a few questions um, and I'm afraid we've only got, we have no time, so we have to go to Jan Lucas now. But you may Sorry, Zoe, over around. Yeah. That's okay. I didn't want to interrupt you because it was so good and so thorough. It's just that some of the questions, maybe we could take it to the Slack group and then maybe people who couldn't come could also see some of the great responses I'm sure you'd be able to give because it's more detailed sure. about the statistics or the data itself. Thank you for such a fabulous talk. Claps Brilliant. are coming through now and we're going to move to the next one and catch you later, I hope, maybe on the Slack group for some of the responses. Great, See thanks. Um, can, we, can we copy these out and send them to Slack or does anyone want to contact I directly? will come back later and I'll put them in for you. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. See you in the next one.